Welcome everyone to a short conversation. Well, I want it to be short. I'm not sure how long it's going to go for. Um, this conversation is, the topic today is, is it possible for the mind to be completely free from its conditioning? Can, can the mind ever be free from all of its conditioning? I have been creating these um, Instagram stories uh, almost daily. Well, actually the goal is to create them daily so that I can one, practice my graphic design. And secondly, I can uh, practice my writing, <laughs> like uh, journaling or not journaling. Well, yeah, sort of journaling and, um, and creating short stories or, or you know, short content. So on Instagram, if you haven't followed me, I've created these little short uh, stories where I ask questions like this, you know, and I go a little bit into depth. Um, I'm creating them daily because I want this year, I want it to be filled with, I want 2022 to be filled with more graphic design work from, from my part. And so I've been, uh, I've been working on that. I, I'm trying to do something, do a design once a day, once a day. Hi, Mary Leanne. Welcome. Hello. Uh, we just say, but Mr. Pickle, welcome. Um, I've been having these conversations on Instagram and um, they've been, they've been interesting. I, I've I've been at, I've been allowed or able to ask, excuse me, ask you all questions, uh, deep questions. Some of you may see those questions as pointless or silly, but I think they they really matter. And so today's question is: Is the mind capable? Is it possible for the mind to live without its condition, without its conditioning? And so, in order for us to tackle that, hi Jackie, hi. In order for us to tackle that, I think we need to first look at what it mean, what I mean by by its conditioning. Um, by its conditioning, I mean, I think of like I think of the mind as a basket. And when we're children, we fill we begin to fill that basket with with the things that we believe in. Uh, part of it is filling it with maps, so like the map of the world, so that we know how to navigate through it. Uh, for example, the first thing we learn is who our mama and who our daddy is, right? Um, uh, a little little dark joke here, but if you're Mexican, you probably don't know the daddy part. <laughs> um, um, but you start filling it with with descriptions of the world, right? And then your mind, the content begins to be filled with all these things, right? But it goes beyond that. Um, we start adding definitions and meanings to the things that we're observing, to the things that we're watching. And then our mind starts to become cluttered and uh, we fill our consciousness with nothing but, but things that either don't exist or we fill it with too many things of the past, right? Hi, Roxana, how you got my joke, huh? Um, we fill it with too many things of the past. So the mind in its, in its raw form is the past. It's an accumulation of the past. Um, and so whenever we are experiencing something in the, in the moment, in this current moment, the mind always filters it through the past, right? And I'm saying, is there a way, is it possible that we can look at something without that mind interrupting what we are seeing and calling it and naming it and wanting to define it and uh, accept it or reject it or to change it or, or any of that? Is it possible that we could do that? I was subbing in pre-K at the beginning of the year and I had to teach the students that mommy's name isn't mommy and <laughs> the same daddy. That's cute. That's really cute. Um, <laughs> that's cute. So the question is that, is it possible for, for the mind to empty itself from its contents and to live a life free from from all the things that come along with it. So free from the anger, from the violence, from the, from resentment, from jealousy, from desires, from ambitions and all that other. Uh, oh, thank you, Margie. I appreciate the, the super chat. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and the reason why this is important, first it's important to know, to know how conditioning works. We build ideas of ourselves. We build ideas of the world. And unfortunately, oh, I hope my Wi-Fi isn't, isn't too bad here. Um, it's saying that my Wi-Fi is kind of low. Hopefully you all are not, I'm not coming, coming out uh, all choppy. Um, <clears throat> but um, the question is that. So we're conditioned 
from a young age to see the world a very specific way, to see ourselves a very specific way. We start to define our parents, to define the world, to define our neighbors, to define um, our teacher, our education. We, we add labels to nearly everything. And the question is, is it possible not to, not to label and not to do any of that? And some of you may say, like, well, what's the point? What, what does it matter whether we, we label things or not? And it matters because there, there's, a, there's a huge danger in it. It's dangerous to, to operate from a conditioned mind. And we don't know that there's another option. We don't know that there's something else, something, something better that we can do, something that will stop our suffering in its tracks, something that will help us understand the world better and will allow us to navigate through it without um, as much suffering, right? Because the world seems to be suffering. Um, it also, it also changes or dictate, dictates whether or not I am violent or if I am aggressive with, with the world. And that's my contribution to society. If I, am, if I am violent, therefore society is violent because I am contributing violence to that, to that society. If I am um, frustrated or impatient, then I'm contributing impatience, right? The answer to that is, is possible because I've had to do it lately. However, I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. It's not. Sorry, I'm trying to pull your, your, your answer here. Um, the answer to that is, to that, it is possible because I've had to do that lately. However, I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. It's not, right? It's not easy because conditioning, conditioning, your conditioning, sorry, our conditioning took years to develop. It took years for me to understand who I am and, and to accept everything that I've been told that I am. Um, and it took um, a long time to work on this image, on the image. Let's look at the language there, right? Alicia, hi. Hi, Alicia. Sorry, I keep looking down here because the screen's down here now. I, I, I switched rooms. Um, it took a long time to build this image. So, so conditioning your mind not to do it, no, that conditioning is not the right, the right idea because we don't want to condition our mind not to be conditioned because that would be considered still conditioning. Um, but it's going, it's not going to be easy. It's not easy at all. And so the question is, again, if you, if you just joined us, the question is, is it possible to, for the mind to be free from its conditioning, right? In the Christian world, I'm learning a lot about how you see the mind and how you experience the mind and what the mind does or what it means. But if anybody has any input on that, feel free to share it. I'll, I'll bring it up on the screen. Um, what is the mind? How does the mind work? Is my mind, my brain, are, they, are the two together? Are the two the same? Are they connected or is the, the mind a tool that the, that the brain uses? Does that, does that make sense? Does that connect with you? I can reword it or, or say it differently if, if, that doesn't, if that doesn't click. Good, thanks Roxana. Um, the reason why this is important is because part of our conditioning Part of our conditioning has to do with what we do. It, it, all of our action comes from, from that place. Um, our spirit wants to, wants to be a good person. It wants to, for example, uh, attain, be close to God. And this mind and all of its content always interferes with the connection. It always interferes with the action. Um, it desires to be close to God, but it doesn't know the mind itself doesn't know the difference between something that is good and something that is harmful. And it ends up uh, chasing after its own desires, chasing after its own ambitions, because it does have its own ambitions. And it gets you into trouble. So, so ultimately, what I'm asking is, is it possible to not sin at all? Is it possible to understand our sin and to dissolve it? To put an end to it, and I know this language scares some Christians because um, because some of you will think, well, if we're if we were capable of doing that, then we have no need for Jesus. But that's not true. That's not true at all. And we'll we'll, we'll explore that together. 
we'll explore it together because I don't want to make any assertions. I want to have this to be a conversation. Mary Ann says, um, I also, also in the Christian world, what has helped me is reading chrono a chronological Bible. I had to let go of everything I thought I knew about God or the Bible just to read it. It's changed my life. Okay, I, I have to look into that and see what that means. Um, the truth will set you free, says, be transformed by renewing of your mind. Okay, so what does that mean? I've heard that multiple times. And I, I, I have an idea of what that means. I've sat with that for a little bit. And it's like, it seems like something that Christians say often. But what does it really mean? Have we broken that down? Be transformed. Who? Who is, who is transformed? It says be transformed. Who is, the, who is the one that's being transformed here? Now, before you say no, let's look at it. Before you say no, let's look at it. Because that no, that instant no, that quick no is coming from conditioning. So let's take a quick look at that. Okay? Because Christ may have been the only one that never sinned throughout his entire life, but that doesn't mean, does it? Does it? I'm asking. Does that mean that we can't stop? We can't stop that once we see the danger of it. So in this statement, be transformed, who is it? What is it that's transformed? We, we see by, by renewing of your mind. Who renews your mind? Is it something that I'm doing? I'm going to renew my mind? Is it something that I let go of and I allow Christ to do it? If so, how? What does he do? How does he do it? And what is it that's transformed? Because the mind is renewed, but what is it that's transformed? As a younger man, I will confess it is incredibly difficult to live holy in today's society. I need this discussion. Okay, so we're going to discuss it together. We're going to figure figure this out together. See, because for, for from if you allow yourself to be completely still, what does it mean to be still? Let's look at that first. I'm going to take a look through some answers while you figure while you think think about that. I believe the mind doesn't do things by itself. It is what we give to the mind. So who are you that's giving things to the mind? I, I agree with you, and I want to add something to it, okay? I want to add to it. I believe the mind doesn't do things by itself. The mind is a tricky, tricky little thing. The mind has hijacked you. The mind has hijacked you. The mind is a tool that we use to make a map of the world. It has, it's filled, it's filled itself with all the contents of what it believes itself to be. It's created an image of itself and it believes that it is that image. But, it's, but it also is something that is aware that unless you give it something to do, it will, it will be silent and it fears that silence. Because when, it's, when, it, when there is silence, it, it doesn't exist anymore. Does that, does that connect? The mind, I'm going to try to say that again. The mind is something that feels that a tool that you use to make sense of the world, to map the world. And it starts to fill itself with, with content, with ideas, with beliefs, with concepts, with habits, wants, dislikes, desires, ambitions, jealousy, anger, hatred, resentment, desire for heaven, fear of hell. Um, all of that is filled. Is The mind is filled with all of that. It houses all of that. The issue is that it creates an identity for itself. It creates an image for itself. And it believes itself to be the one that knows. 
And the mind isn't the knower. The mind isn't the one that knows. It only gathers information. It's the brain itself that is the knower. It's the brain that all of this information gets stored in. And before we say no to that, let's just take a look at that, okay? But the mind, the mind knows that if you don't give it something to do, if you don't, if it's not moving, if it, if you don't give it something to think about, or something to ponder, or something to, to, to imagine, because the imagination works in that same field. If you don't give it something to do, then it has to be still, and it doesn't like stillness because in stillness it ceases to exist. The mind ceases to exist. And so it, it wants something to do all the time, which is why there's always this constant chatter, that never ending chatter that always is always thinking, it's always predicting, it's always analyzing, always. And that's all of that is just a waste of energy. All of that is just a waste of energy. So I'm asking, okay, because it's true what you just said, what you said, uh, Roxana, that the mind, you have to give it something to do. So who are you? that gives your mind something to do. Is it possible? Hey, what's up, uh, Matt? Is it possible for me to, for me to look at something, to observe something, to sit and just look at something without the contents of my mind interrupting the scene? Is, I'll say that again. Is it possible? Is it possible? that I can look at something and observe it and be, and, and be so attentive that the mind and all the contents of my mind do not interfere the seeing of it. That my mind doesn't jump in and say, that's bad or that's good, but just, the, just to see it, just to look right at it and not name call it and not call it anything, not accept it or reject it or say that it's good, or say that it's bad, or say that this is heavenly, or say that this is evil, or to call something demonic simply because I don't understand it, or because it doesn't fit the frame that I've created in my in my faith, if you want to call it that, or Chris, Christian faith. Um, can I look at something without that frame interrupting what I'm seeing, and then naming it evil, naming it demonic, naming it whatever, whatever what have you? I'm not trying to teach any new age stuff here. I'm just simply seeing like walking. Can you, can you look at something without your mind moving it in, or touching it in any direction in any way whatsoever? This is the true, this is, this is what true meditation is. True meditation is this. It's not, it's not what, what new age makes it seem to be where there's like, you have to focus on this mantra. You get this word and you focus it. It could be, it could be any word. You could say, um, you know, focus on the word iPhone. I mean, it could be literally anything. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's, it's, it's nonsense. You're still giving your mind something to do. And I'm saying, can we look at something? Can we think of something? Can we be in the presence of something, of God, if you want to call it that? If you want, if you want that to experience that? Can you be in the presence of God without your without your mind interrupting that interaction. Can I take a walk and look at a tree and see the tree without naming it or remembering, or remembering that I fell off of a tree once or what have you? Archie boy has his big boy bark now. Uh, let's see. Distraction can be saludos. Saludos desde Puerto Rico. Love your videos. Hey, Jose. Saludos. Um, Ar you can hear Archie boy with his big, big boy bark now. Distraction can be of Satan. It's a great way for him to distract you from the things of God. I would want to look at what about me makes it so that I'm easily distracted. That's where the problem is. What? If I want to look at, at, 
if I want to look at the dark one and I give him my attention, I'm trapped in his web. But what about me makes it that I take my eyes off of the great spirit? He thinks everything's danger now. Like he sees the neighbor taking out trash and he's over there barking. Christians have a mantra. The word is Jesus. It's so amazing focusing on the word, the name, same as Yahweh. Okay, let's uh, let's take a look at that. It doesn't really matter if you focus on, on a Sanskrit word or if you focus on the name Jesus as, as long as as long as you're not confusing the word for the thing. I can't confuse the word phone with the phone itself. I can't confuse the word hat with the hat itself. Does that make sense? So what does it mean to be still? I think I might have missed some of your comments. It's weird when your soul leaves your body. Your mind still seems to be there. Even this body is a vessel right now. I agree with that. But is it your mind? I, I, um, goodness, I haven't, my, in my, I hate to say in my experience, but I have to say it that way because language, language uh, limits me. But, The spirit has a knowing of its own, or the soul. You, you call it soul. The spirit or the soul has a knowing, an intelligence of its own. The mind is a tool that the brain uses to interpret the world. And, it, and the brain also stores stores knowledge and it stores things and we call things we call that memory but the spirit has an intelligence all on its own things that get recorded into the spirit more profound that the mind itself doesn't doesn't record or it doesn't hold on to This is important. This is really, really important. And I hope that like, that people, I really wish that people would take this a lot more seriously. Being still is to slow the mind down and not keep trying to fix it. If we are still and know he is God, then we stand back and let him be God. Yes. The tricky part is that the mind, the mind likes to play that trick. The mind likes to pretend to be still. The mind likes to pretend to play, to be still. And then it tricks you into, into this false still, stillness. And, and so by, by slowing down, you got to be careful that you're not, you're not touching the mind at all. To slow the mind down, it means that I am doing something with the mind. And I'm talking about a stillness that I don't even do anything. There's no effort. Because in that effort is, is the movement of the mind. And I'm trying to be still. So I'm not trying to slow the mind down. I'm trying to be still. If I am slowing the mind down, then I'm not still because I'm doing something. I'm actively slowing the mind. And I'm talking about stillness, complete stillness. And some people are afraid of that because when you hear words like you have to empty your mind, people are like, well, well if you empty out the contents of your mind, then you're going to forget how to talk and how to walk. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, that, that you give the mind its place its place so that if you need to talk that the mind obeys and just talks it doesn't exaggerate the idea it doesn't suppress the idea it doesn't move the idea it doesn't change the idea it doesn't have its opinion but that you just be still and when you say when you want to speak that the mind knows its its place in and and it speaks nothing more, nothing more than what you wanted to say.
I can't get the mind to be still. If I could suggest something, I would say, watch it. Watch your mind. Don't try to change it. Don't try to slow it down. Don't try to, don't try to stop it. It's like a monkey. You'll never be able to catch it. You'll never be able to catch it. It's really slick and slippery. And the mind feeds off of one thing. Roxana, we've had this conversation and we've said, and you've answered it before. What does the thought, what, what, is, what gives a thought power? What gives, what gives a mind power? The mind can focus and it can concentrate. The mind can focus and it can concentrate. But can it be still? Can it be, can it be attentive? Right. <laughs> attention. The mind feeds off of your attention. If you're trying to slow it down, you're giving it what it wants. It wants attention, like a child. Like a child that's throwing a tantrum. If you ignore the child, eventually he's going to see you're not paying attention and then he'll stop. He or she will stop. Because it just wants your attention. But if you go over there and get angry, it doesn't matter if you're giving them good attention or bad attention. You're giving the child attention and it, and it, and it does what it wants further. Alicia, what do you mean? Be careful not to overthink. Overthink. Think. There's no such thing as overthink. What do you mean? What do you mean by by overthink? I mean, try not to overthink. Can you give it rest? I have issues with that. Bad sleeping, etc. Yes, you can. Did you know that a mind, a mind, you know, did you know that you're not supposed to dream at night? You're not, you're not supposed to dream. You're not supposed to have any dreams. Dreaming is the mind's way of, of the, or your subconscious mind's way of trying to resolve an issue that you haven't resolved in your waking life. Something that you're avoiding, something that you're ignoring. And because the mind likes to work in, in, in images, it flashes images in your mind, in, in your, in your mind's eye. And it's like a puzzle. You have to piece it together. It doesn't know how to tell you certain things. I'm not trying to interpret dreams. Okay. But your dreams can be interpreted and they can only be interpreted by you because you know what problems you're facing. I'll give you a perfect example. I used to have a dream that, that I was in an airplane and it, it would, take off out of the airport, but it would never take flight. It would go over the fence and suddenly I'm, I'm in, I'm in like the city on the freeways on this airplane that won't take off. It can't take off. It just goes up and then it comes right back down. And I was thinking to myself, like, what is it? Why, why do I keep having that dream? Of course, I'm not going to go to like a dream interpreter, but seriously, I, I looked closely into my waking life and I thought, how, where, where do I feel this way? And I realized that I was working a job that I, I didn't, that was going nowhere. I was working a job that I was not happy in. It wasn't taking off. It wasn't, it was going nowhere. And then I realized that my subconscious mind is just simply trying to tell my conscious mind, Hey, wake up. That job's going nowhere. So I, I switched jobs and I stopped having that dream. In fact, I had a dream that I was flying, not, I was flying the plane, but the, the plane was actually flying, you know, little things like that. You're, but a mind that is not conflicted, a mind that has resolved all of its issues is not supposed to dream because your, your subconscious mind goes, okay, we're good. I don't have, I don't have anything to resolve. See, the problem with that is that if you, if you're not fully, if you don't, if you don't remove the contents of your mind, if you don't give your mind that space to, to, to breathe and to be empty and you don't give it its place then two two things happen the first is that when you go to sleep you're not fully asleep you're half asleep because you're dreaming 
So your body's not resting. Your eyes are constantly shifting back and forth. Your brain is active when it should be resting. So that means that when you're asleep, you're not fully asleep. And guess what? When you're awake, you're tired, which means you're not fully awake either. You're half asleep. See? So you're never, you're never resting, neither when you're awake nor when you're asleep. So you have to have these small moments of, of, of meditation, if I may call it that, with your permission, I'll call it that, of meditation. And by that, I don't mean sit on a lotus pose with your arms like this in this position in your hands and go, oh, I'm not talking about that meditation. I'm not talking about um, transcendental meditation. It's all the same. It's, it's, it means nothing. It's, it's something meant for people to make money, f make money off of you out of something that you don't fully understand. And that's something that they don't fully understand either. It's like, if, if I, if I suddenly made money, um, teaching people how to speak in tongues and I say, I got it, just start doing this. And I, and I start making money selling courses on how to speak in tongues without fully understanding how and why that is a gift and how that's given to you. So what do I mean by small moments of meditation? I mean that you take a moment to be fully attentive to what you're doing in the moment. That you're not washing your hands and thinking that after you're done washing your hands, you have to cook. If you're thinking about what you're going to do after, your mind is in the future. Your mind is focused on something that isn't happening yet. And who knows, you might even wash your hands correctly. But to be fully present and to feel your hand, to watch your fingers and to feel the soap and to feel the water running to, through your hand and just have a moment where you're fully present, where your attention is completely in this moment, not in what happened, what's going to happen after and not what happened before you began washing your hands, but that you're completely immersed in this moment, one with God, one in this moment where God, where God is. You give yourself enough of those moments in your daytime. By the time you're done going to sleep, as long as you're not going, as long as you're not activating your mind and uh, by watching something before you go to sleep, but you give yourself a break from your phone or social media about an hour before so that your mind could start to sort of slow down and, and you condition your mind not to have your mind condition you. So you're not supposed to dream at night. You're not supposed to have any dreams. That doesn't mean that if you are dreaming that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's bad. Okay. I just want you to watch it. To observe your inner workings. Watch how your mind works. This isn't, this isn't new age stuff. Okay. I'm not teaching you something that's going to walk, to push you away from your faith. I'm trying to show you all something another a, a tool that's available to you to make your experience with the, with the great spirit i hate to use this word better but um to make your experience with the relationship with your relationship with the great spirit real un unfiltered un not perverted by the mind so that you, you can experience the great spirit without the mind saying, yes, I've experienced it. Isn't that cool? Forget all that. Forget that it's cool. Forget that it's great. Forget that you have to, you want to share it on social media. I just totally had a moment with God and God said this. Like, what? That's for you. Yoga is a word. It's like if I said, Unity. You wouldn't say unity is a word of a religion. Unity is the, not, let's re disregard the word itself. Just forget about the word unity. Look at the thing, what it means to be united, what it means that to be one with one another, to be in, to be in connection with, with one another. I want to say community, but, but you understand what I mean. Somebody asked earlier, is yoga, oh, in yoga we have 
uh, Shavasana, yeah, and we lay there doing nothing. It's a thought. If a thought comes in, we are told not to judge it, but to let it be a thought and to let it go. We don't we don't dwell. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yoga can be anything. We've only we've we've actually connected that word to a a sort of like a physical practice. Um, but it, it's yoga is not positions. <laughs> it's not. That's one. That's one practice. That's one practice. But uh, yoga, yoga just means to unite, to be united, to unite, to be whole. That, that's all it means. What the reason why people practice a physical version of it in its original form, okay? I'm not talking about what New Age has turned it into. I'm talking about in its original form, in its original form, is that you hold stress in your body and you take care of your spine and you make sure that everything, every part of your body is functioning correctly, that it doesn't hurt to do this, okay? Because if it hurts to do that, I'm, I'm, I'm tense and it distracts me from, it, 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 the physical is a distraction, becomes a distraction. But unless unless you know what it is, I don't think we I don't think anybody should be talking about yoga unless they know exactly what it is. You can't hear about it in the church and uh, say things, for example, like this: like meditation is cool, yoga is standing in various uh, positions, speaking to demonic spirits. Like I don't know, like that's that's not that's not correct. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to sell yoga to you. Okay, I'm not. But that's not true. People from that cold are completely knowledgeable about this. No, that's not true. That is not true. That is completely false. I've heard this a lot in in uh, Christian videos of people who are casting demons and stuff and they talk about yoga. They don't know what yoga is. They keep saying like this new age, new age, new age. And I get it. You're attacking new age because it's new age that has taken Eastern ideas and ha are trying to blend it with Christian ideas and you don't like that. So I get that. But you're talking about a group of people that they themselves don't understand yoga. They've perverted yoga. They've perverted meditation. They perverted it by talking about, uh, you know, the law of attraction and to manifesting things and to, um, you know, the Kundalini power and that you have this power that if you connect all your chakras, you're going to be walk on water or what have you or whatnot in that. And then they use scripture to try to sell you on that. I'm not talking about that. That's not, that's not yoga. That isn't yoga. It's like if I took Jonestown and said, that's Christianity, is it? Or if I took Westboro and said, and, and identified that as Christianity, is it? Or Waco, what happened in Waco? Like, am I going to, is it fair for me to say that that's Christianity? I've discovered, oh, um, right. I'm not here to sell anybody uh, yoga. Okay. So don't, don't say, don't quote me as the, as me making yoga be okay. Um, or that I'm, that I somehow am saying that it's okay to cast demons or to invoke demons. I'm, no, I'm not saying that at all. We have to be very careful not to open a door to the enemy. If we're afraid of something we don't understand, we've already opened the door. If we're afraid of something we don't understand, we've already opened the door. That's exactly what I'm saying. Is it possible to look at something without 
your conditioning interrupting the scene and in the scene you see it for what it actually is Brenda D, today I was asking a question. Can the mind ever be free from its conditioning? Can the mind ever look at something without letting its conditioning interrupt the scene? The looking. Why is that important? Because if you're not careful, if you're not careful in this way, and you're afraid of something you don't understand, um, you could already be opening that door. Because fear, fear is not of God. God didn't give you that, that spirit. What conditions? Your conditioning. Your training. Your everything that you believe, the, the everything that your mind is the contents of your mind that interrupt all of your daily living. No, not emotions. Your emotions are part of it, yeah. But I'm talking about all of your identity. A Hindu spiritual and ascetic discipline, a part of, of which including breath control, simply meditation, and the adoption of specific bodily postures. A Hindu spiritual and ascetic discipline. Yeah, um, if you read, if you, I'm not telling you to read it, okay? But you can, I'm not shy from it. I'm not asking you to read it, but if you want to, to test what I'm saying, if you want to see whether or not what I'm saying is true, then read it yourself. In the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm, I'm an amateur in that as well, but in the Bhagavad Gita, you have Lord Krishna talking to Arjuna about something and he tells him to practice his yoga. And he's not talking about going into poses. Don't 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 just Google something and and give an answer to it. Talk to talk to someone who's a devout Hindu about it, and you'll see that 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 it's not what you think it is. It's been demonized by people who don't want you to to even look at it. Okay, those are emotions, reactions to outside situations. Right, now what I'm saying is, is it possible for you not to react? Is it possible that you can look at something and not react to it? Or, or at the very least, that you can look at something and, and if you have an internal reaction, that you look at, your, that you can see your internal reaction and not act on that reaction but that you just let that reaction arise inside of you and want to do something, but that you stop it before it actually does something. For example, I'm out in the street somewhere and someone, another man cuts me off and, or I'm in line and he stands right in front of me. There's a reaction in me that upsets me, right? Because, because I've been standing in line this whole time and this guy just comes and cuts me. Right? So there's something wrong about that, right? Wrong about that. Instantly, my mind is, is already labeling that. And there's a reaction in me. I get anger. Can I stop it before I say, excuse me, the line's back there, and then get into an altercation with this person? Can I stop it before it, before it gets to that point? And further... Is it possible for me to put an end to that reaction altogether? Because that reaction is dangerous. There's, it's a dangerous thing to do. But rather, you know the difference between acting and acting, I'm sorry, reacting and responding, right? There's a difference between acting, I mean, sorry, reacting and responding. You go to the doctor, the doctor tells you you've had a reaction to the medication. Is that good or bad? The doctor says you've you had a, your doctor tells your family he's had a re, he or she has had a reaction to the to the medication. You're staying there until they figure out what's going on. Right? It means your body 
saw the medicine as something bad and it attacked it without knowing that the medicine is actually there to help. And when you respond to the medication, that's a good thing. It says he, he or she responded to the medication. He's going to be okay in a few hours and go home. That means that, that your body didn't fight the medicine itself. Here, I'm not here. Let's look at this one. You can change your conditioning if you're pro, if you've processed the casual emotions, but most of us don't get that deep because they are the most they are the most painful. Yet they are the ones that set us free. That's exactly my point. When I go and touch a flame of fire, ah, I see the danger of it. It's dangerous to touch fire. I get burned. I see the danger of it. I don't run away from the fire, but I see the danger. And if I'm going to cook my meal, I'm going to be more careful with, when, I, when I'm interacting with the fire. But I know the danger of it, so I don't, I don't touch it. So why do we continue to touch the same emotions? Why do we continue to touch the same thoughts that burn us time and time and time again? And we say things like, I, I'm, I'm fallen and I'm sinful and I sin every day. Why haven't you stepped away? And as you, as you pointed out, and, and I'm saying you, general you, okay? I'm not singling anybody out. Why haven't you stepped back and taken a deep look at, at, at those painful emotions or the painful thoughts and see the danger of them and not touch them? Because in the scene of it arises a different form of intelligence and in that scene, you don't have to make an effort to dissolve them anymore. Just by you seeing them, you've already detached yourself from them. You've already disconnected from them. If you're not comfortable with the word detached. The mind can be free from conditioning if we let it. As the mind is the battleground, it can be shaped and focused as we need, as we need it to. It's your choice in the brain how to react to the situation or thought. Right. And I want to, I want to, if, if you can say that to yourself one more time, and instead of saying the word react, use the word respond and see how that feels. See how that might be different. See, uh, Roxana, it's uh, it is a process, and more we are one with God. Oh, the more we are one with God, the more we can do that. We easily see the see the God's will and and what we should understand and how to react. Right. I like that. Oh, come on. Okay. His relationship with the Lord has been lifelong and it had taught him patience and self-control. All right, patience and self-control. Ooh, to have patience, you have to be fully present. You have to be, you have to be attentive to see whatever it is that's unfolding in front of you and watch it unfold without you wanting to change it or even control it. You talk about self-control. We don't want to control the self. Because self-control is like a, the mind can be tricky in that way where it could trick itself into believing that it's controlling itself. I'm talking about just being so still that the mind wants your attention, it demands your attention, and you give it none. And then what happens? But God created us to be able to, to uh, be able to process all painful emotions. Healing is emotional, not mind-based. Our mind is the servant to our emotions, not our emotions or soul, not the other way around. Yes, yes. And what, which, which is what I said in the beginning, big beginning of this talk, is that the mind has hijacked 
us. It has, it has, it, it thinks it is the center of our being and it's not, it's a tool that we use. We, you behind the mind, the one that watches the thoughts, the one that is feeling the feelings, the mind serves you. But in this state, in this case, when, when the mind believes itself to be the center, then when somebody offends you, you get offended. When somebody says something offensive, you get offended. Why? Because they're hurting an image. But the you, the spirit, it can't be touched by words. It can't be harmed by words. It can't be hurt in, in, in the same way that your emotions can be hurt. Let's see. First Corinthians 6, 3 tells us that we that one day we who believe in Christ will judge angels. Judges have to be impartial. God is impartial. And we would and he would teach us how to be impartial to things. I yeah, I agree with that. Not that not that it matters that I agree with it or not. Um that's not an easy place to reach, but it's not impossible either. And yet when you reach it, it happens in an instant. It's not like you have to do this, 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 and then boom, you're there. Sometimes you try and then without even trying, you fall into it and you're like, oh, I was here. I was in the presence. I was in his presence. I was, I had clarity. I had peace. I had joy. And then it slipped away from me. Why? Because the mind jumps in and goes, yes, okay, I got it. I finally got peace. And it's like, no, 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 no. Where to go? Where to go? Where to go? Because the mind itself can never hold peace because the mind itself by nature is, is divisive. The mind can never hold on to joy or peace or anything like that because it itself is divisive. It sees the world and it divides it. It splits it. It splits the world. And the only way for you to have peace of mind is for you not to pay attention to the mind and for you to empty it out of all of its content so that it's not constantly chattering. Why does nobody teach, teach this? Nobody wants to teach this because the moment you start teaching it, they're going to call a new age and then it's rejected. But this is helpful stuff. This is important, important stuff. Stuff that, that as a human being, we're, we're, we should know how to do. It's, it's a part of our emotional intelligence. But we shy away, away with it. And then we wonder why the dark one, the devil, or whatever you want to call it, is uh is playing around with with our tools because we don't stand guard we we leave our we leave the mind to its own to its own vices or devices whatever the phrase is and then um and it finds a door I've studied and tried lots of beliefs and, and ways to heal. Nothing matches what I found outside of religion. No judgment to those who do about my soul and God except divine truth answers all questions. Is, is God a religion? Or is religion a tool that we use to try to organize what God wants from us so that we can have something practical to, to, to do in our daily lives, and then we can maybe, hopefully, have that experience with with God. Are the do they do they are the two do the two connect? It doesn't. <laughs> oh, I, I hope I hope you don't feel like I'm picking on you, Alicia. Okay, I, I hope you don't. Um, I, I'm really loving this conversation, and I love I love what you're throwing at me. So please don't ever feel that that you're being attacked or anything like that okay and if you are please communicate that with me and i will i will correct it okay i will correct it but for for me there's no other peace but god's peace and this is what i'm trying to tell you 
that you're okay with, with that we have peace. And it has to be God's peace. I agree. It does have to be God's peace. But in order for it to be God's peace, it can't be a mental peace. It can't be that the mind, that something that, that the mind cultivated, it cannot be cultivated by the mind. Otherwise, it's not peace. So you're right. It has to be God's peace. I said yesterday in the live that I had with uh, on Instagram that somebody threw the word awe, A-W-E. And I said this, in order for you to experience what we know as awe or beauty or peace, real peace, joy, love, wonder, in order for, for anyone to experience that in its raw form, when, when I experience awe, the me doesn't exist. Only when the me doesn't exist can I experience awe. Otherwise, the mind hijacks it and turns it into into something it organizes it into something it, it says it says ah maybe this is the way to connect with god you have to go out into the desert and be under the stars we'll start a fire we'll sing some music and now it's become something organized and while you may have that experience of like wow and you, you look at the sky and you go wow look at how beautiful that is that's just the mind it's the mind saying, wow, how beauty it is, beautiful it is. Because when you are completely amazed by something, when, when you are in complete awe of something or someone, there are no words. The me shuts up. The, the false me doesn't know what to do. It dissolves. It wants to jump in and say, can I label that, please? Can I give that meaning? And, and you can't because you're completely immersed, completely fully in its presence. And that's God. God is a space. God is a, a, a state of being. Please don't turn that into new age, okay? I'm not new age. I'm not. But we all experiences, ex have experienced this pocket. We've all experienced a little tiny little taste of that. And then it slips away from us. So we want that again. And we think that through prayer, through, through going to church, we're going to experience that again. And some churches will help you with that by, by putting music on. The pastor will even speak in a, in a sort of crying voice. And, uh, you know, and you, I'm not trying to mock. Please do not think that I'm mocking it. I'm not mocking it. I'm just, I'm just telling you. And then you feel it. And, and, and it's, it's artificial. It's, it's cultivated. And when you are in the presence of God, it's, that is not cultivated. It's you surrendering, you not wanting to force it, you not wanting to grab onto it. It's you letting it go. And then it's like when you're, when you're in, in water. What happens if you, if you panic? You sink. But when you relax, your body does what it does naturally. It floats. So being in that presence is not something that you're going to sit like many people try to do. I'm going to sit here and do some, some transcendental meditation and I'm going to connect with the higher, with the higher self and connect with, with God. Or I'm going to twist myself into a pretzel in hopes that when I do that, I'm going to activate the chakras and then I'm going to connect. No. You could spend a lifetime doing all that and never once connect. Or you can go for a walk and connect like that. And be in his presence, just like that. You know, like that, faster than that, even. Same here, it's just that. Faster than that. 
being present, being in it, inviting him. Let's let's look at it that way. But please don't turn this into a methodology. Don't turn this into an idea or a concept. Just see this. What? Just invite him. Invite him into your hand washing. Invite him into your drive. Invite him into your your work. Invite him to be there in that moment. Say, in this moment, can you do this with me? But you have to, we still have to look at this, this original question. Can the mind ever be free from its conditioning? Because if your mind is full of its conditioning, then when you invite him, how do you know you're inviting him and not something else? How do you know your mind is not going to settle for something less than? If, if your mind is full of, of suffering and pain and it doesn't want to look at that pain, how do you know that the dark one isn't, isn't using your, your avoidance of that pain to enter and to give you a fake relationship with, with God, but you're really having a relationship with an image of God? It's, it's still... God, it's like if I were to, to have a picture of my mother and then confuse the picture of my mother with my mother, it's still a picture of her, but it's not her. I think uh, Roxana asked if I can define religion and Christianity. Um, religion means to bind together, to bring together. But the way that we experience religion today is a set of rules, a book that is followed, a guideline, a rite of passage, rituals that need to be performed in order for, for you to accept someone into that group, and a worship of a power that's higher than yours, than you. Everyone worshiping that. But along with that comes this tribal mentality that there is a line that is drawn between people who are in your group and people who are not. And that invisible line is responsible for, the, for, for a lot of violence, for hatred, for... a lot of pain and suffering. It's not something that is done intentionally, but just by you identifying with a specific group, you automatically reject the other groups and that creates conflict. That creates conflict. Hi, Regina. Good to see you. That's what I consider to be religion. But what does that have to do with God? Those are just our ideas of what we think God wants for us. But how many of us actually have that conversation with God directly? And how many of those groups tell you you can't do that? Because they want you to do it through them. They want you to follow the rules. They want you to do their method which is why so many Christians have broken up into pieces and you have Methodist, Evangelical, Apolo Apolo the Apologists or whatever it's called, Catholics, 
Jehovah Witnesses, you have so many different groups because you couldn't agree with one specific way to interpret the word. So you've broken off into pieces so that you so that people can follow what you think is the right way of interpreting that word. Understand this, religion is what man can do to, to reach God completely, opposite to gospel, which is what God did to come to us. Understand this, religion is what man can do to reach God completely, or completely opposite of to gospel, which is what God did to come to us. Yes, okay, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. Yeah, good. Oh, okay. That's a good way of seeing it. It's a good way of seeing it. Gospel just means good news, right? I am not 100% agree with that. The line doesn't automatically do wrong. The people use the lines to do to do that, sadly. Right, but un, un, um, unknowingly, unknowingly, you have already, you've already separated yourself from people who don't believe what you believe. The alternative is, is to just be free from all that and to believe without calling yourself something, without, without joining it, but... I don't think that people are capable of doing that. I think we, a lot of us need to be told what to do. I think a lot of us need that guidance from another human being that is posing as being guided by, by God, that what we do is put our faith in that person versus putting our faith in God. So I'm sorry for, for being so direct with that, but this is something that I'm very careful with myself. Okay, because think of all the people who are following that path, the pastors who have been caught in um, in uh, having an affair with someone in their in their in their church. Think of how many people are following that person because he has studied and he has known scripture. And he's telling people that if they're committing adultery that they are sinners and that God hates them or that God doesn't love them. And they're being, they, they are condemning people or encouraging people not to turn away from that, that behavior. And yet they themselves are engaged in that behavior. And if I remember correctly, the Bible says that if you preach adultery, I'm paraphrasing, but if you preach adultery and are an adulterer, that the world, the world blasphemes the name of God because of you. Meaning that the world sees God as something bad because you aren't walking the right road. Somehow the, uh, certain pastors think, think that they, they are exempt. I'm afraid of trusting in people, but the Bible itself and the Holy Spirit, my teacher of all things truth, never lie. Um, I think we'll leave that for another conversation. There are things that I have said lately that I don't think people are comfortable or ready to hear in that way. Um, so I'm going to give myself some time to think about a better way of saying things without, without it feeling like I'm sweeping the rug from under you. I'm more along the lines of religion is what man did to get close to God. Jesus is what God did to get close to man as a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And then man organized that and said, Let's uh, 
Let's tell people what to do. <laughs> of course, we have to choose how to use our beliefs and if, and if love guides us or not, love is the key, right? Absolutely. That's what, that's, that's the key to everything. No, Alicia Leo said that that's why we broke off into all of these denominations. And that's why the forefathers put freedom of religion in, in there. I'm commenting what he's talking about. Okay. God hates sin, not the sinners. We have all sinned. We are told to hate what God hates, which means we are to hate sin, which means we are to hate ourselves. Right? If we're sinners, God hates sin. You are sin. Aren't you? I'm asking questions. I'm not making any assertions here. I'm asking questions. If you are a sinner, that means you're sin. Right? If, a, if an apple is rotten, you say the apple is rotten. You don't say that it has rot. Like, I hate the rot, but I love the apple. Like, the apple's rotten. It's rotten. You know? But to say that God hates something, I don't, I don't, I question that. I question that. I question that because if I say that that love hates, it, it contradicts itself. And I think that I'm not going to make it my personal goal here or anything, but I, I feel like, I don't know if I want to say I feel or I think. Um, I want to, I want to explore all of the cliches that Christians say. All of the things that we say that I don't think many people have actually broken down to, to see what it means. It's just, they've heard it before. So they repeat it and they say, say it. Leo, I have to go now. Otherwise, I'd love to hear your thoughts. God bless everyone tonight. Oh, thank you. God bless you too. Have a good one. Uh, you actually have to tell people what to do as a pastor, mentor, leader, but you have a textbook. My hat, senor, comes off to you because I wouldn't, or maybe I should put it back on. It comes off though. Okay, so imagine it off. It comes off to you because I couldn't take that responsibility. Telling people what to do. It's scary. One, one misinterpreted uh, phrase and I could put somebody in trouble. You know? Okay. Okay, so let's look at that. We are not sin. We commit sin. It's different. See, I'm glad that I asked the question because it's not an assertion. So I know that Alicia asked it. Um, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I, I asked the question because I want to look deeper into things. This isn't overthinking. This is sifting. Sifting the, the, the truth so that we can see what is truth and what is lies. Okay, so we're not sin. We, we commit sin, and which is different. Okay, I, I look at that, and I see clearly the truth of that. And I want to point out that in many of the comments that I receive on the channel, many people don't believe that to be true, or at least they it seems as though they believe something else. Because if sin is something that we commit, that means that sin is an action. And if sin is an action, that means that, that there has to be a thought that triggered that action. Right? Because I can't move this finger unless I, unless I think about it. Right? Or unless I have like Parkinson's. Right? But as far as I know, anything that I do starts with the thought. I entertain a thought. And then... Either I decide that that thought is worthy of, be, of pursuing, so I act on it. Or I see that a, that a thought is not worth pursuing, so I don't act on it. For example, we do this with, with like, for example, if somebody says, hey, go to the store 
and you'll get a hundred dollars or versus go to the store and spend a hundred dollars. I have the, I have the ability of deciding because obviously getting a hundred dollars is better than losing a hundred dollars. So I'm going to take action on the thing that I decide is worth taking action on. And I won't take action on the things that I decide that, that aren't worthy of taking that action. So if sin is the result is an action and is the result of a thought, then why can't I stop that thought? Why can't I stop that action? Why can't I stop that sin? Why do I sin? Why do I behave as though I am like sin is pulling me into doing something that I don't want to do? Because if it's something that I commit, if it's something that I am, I can't do anything about it. If it's if it's what I am, I can't do anything about it. Like, I, like I'm a human. If I don't like being human and I want to be a dog or I want to be a cat, I can't do anything about that. I can't do anything about that. But if I scratch the back of my ear because I have, you know, I feel like I have fleas, that's an action. I have, I can, can stop, I can stop that. Or if I see that eating eating burgers every single day gives me a, a stomach ache, I can stop that. But if I say I'm a burger eater, I can't do anything about that because it's it's a part of my identity. So can we all just decide now? Can we decide the people for the people that are here? Can we decide whether or not sin is an action or if it's what I am? Because if it's what I am, I can't do anything about it. I'm forever going to sin, which means that I can't be saved. Or is it something that I do and something that I can, is it something that an action and therefore something that I can stop doing? According to the Bible, sin is to miss the target, which is the will of God. Right. So if I'm missing the target, that means that that the one pulling the arrow, the one pulling the arrow is deciding to aim at something that it wants. Right. So if my mind is full of its content, my conditioning, and my conditioning says, that as a man, I need to have a, an expensive car so that I can have social status, so that I can attract the right person, the right woman, and I have to have money so that I can feel powerful. I'm going to aim at that. And I'm going to shoot at that, which means I'm going to miss the mark. But if I empty my mind of all that content, if I free myself from my conditioning, and there is no such thing as my will anymore, as my mind having goals, dreams, ambitions, desires, all of that. If I don't allow my mind, because we already we already spoke about this, that the mind, it's a tool that we use, right? It can either hijack us or we can use it. Either it uses us or we use it. And if the mind is a tool, if I choose not to use my mind as a tool to, to get around in this world, then my, my mind is, then my, not my mind. My spirit is completely focused on the things of the spirit. If I allow my mind to, to, if I focus with my mind, then my mind is going to focus on the things of this world. And the things of this world rot. Nothing in this world is permanent, which means that forever I'm going to chase after something that's not going to be permanent. I'm going to chase temporary happiness until that happiness dies out, wears out, and then I'm back to aiming at something else. Never aiming at something eternal. Right. Right. So that when you're aiming at something, you're having you're there in that presence that the mind isn't interrupting. Like we should aim for that. That, that that's worth something over there. That's worthy of, of, of our attention. 
And, and if you if you're wise, if you're wise, you will you will listen only to God. You will say, "What do you want? What do you want me to aim at?" And God says, "Aim at this. This is of the Spirit. This is eternal. This is worthy, worth more than this other thing that the mind is telling you to aim at, which is temporary, which will pass, which will die, which will." dissolve in your hand like water it'll sip through slip through your fingers so let his will his goal his his target If we sin as a Christ follower, we ask forgiveness and we are forgiven. See, okay, when I, when I think of things like that, like, like following Christ, I'm looking at his footsteps. I'm watching him. I see what he does. And so my goal is to put my foot where he's put his foot. If I sin as a follower of Christ, am I following Christ? No, I've taken my eyes off of him to look at this other thing. Which means what? I'm not following him. I'm following something else. My, my senses are distracted. My, my eyes are, have been distracted. And it looks at that shiny thing over there. And then suddenly I've taken my mind. My mind, my mind has hijacked me and, and pulled me in that direction. And Christ is over here. Don't, don't take what I'm saying and believe it as truth. Like see it for yourself. Walk yourself through it. The mind, the, the mind is going to try to hijack that, that, that scene. But look at it. Look at it. And watch the mind what it does. It tries to have an answer for everything. You ask a question, huh, why do I get angry? And the mind jumps in like, oh, we get angry because this person is so mean to us. No, that's not why I get angry. Because the person could be mean. I can't control that person. But I control my anger. So it's got to be something else. Right. Hi. All right, Jackie, you need to go to bed. Good night. Thanks for joining us. Right. So I'm talking about attention here today. Can the mind ever be free of its conditioning so that you, whatever you call yourself, spirit, soul, whatever, so that you can see something with absolute attention without the mind interfering interrupting manipulating changing accepting rejecting molding defining or any of that all of that is a process of movement of the mind can you look at something and just see it without calling it by its name without defining it, without changing it, without rejecting it or accepting it or making up ideas of it or allowing that something that a pastor said about it being demonic or can you just look at it? Because if you, if you look at something, you see it in its raw form and you don't need to call it anything. It, it all on its own will reveal if it's something of the spirit or if it's something of the world. You know, and like when we, we I'm, I'm purposely doing this, by the way, okay? I'm not picking on any of you. I'm purposely doing this. I want you all to pay attention to your words because your words dictate how you see things and then you create images. So like we are saints who need to keep our eyes focused on Christ. Which eyes? The only thing that I want to ask is that you be careful not to make an image of Christ and then look at that image but that you focus your, your inner scene, not, not, your, not your third eye, that's nonsense. Your inner scene, your eye doesn't see, you know that, right? It's not your eye that sees, your eye interprets light and your brain sees, but you, 
when you are in complete attention and you're fully present in this moment, you see with something else. You see with something else. No, no, sorry. There is seeing. There is seeing. There's no seer. There's no seer. There's just seeing. The seer is that mind that says, I see this, I see that, and wants to call things, name things, slap a label on something, slap a meaning to things. I'm not talking about the seer, just to see, see the thing. Right? So we just got to just be mindful of that language. That That's... That's that's all. It's not literal. Yeah, yeah, I know. But then there's also this sort of like imaginative scene, a scene with the mind. And uh, and sometimes that mind will create an image and then see that image. And then it believes that image to be so real and so and a part of it. I'm going to be doing some more reaction uh, videos soon. Just want to make sure that I, I, uh, that I'm right, not correct, but that I'm, that I'm okay, that I'm in a good place. And that doesn't mean that I'm not in a good place. You seem to be answering your own questions. We're looking at them all together. What if I told you, I see that your father abandoned you and life was very difficult then? I'm sorry, what if you told me that my father abandoned me? What about that? Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry, Dave. No, my father, my father didn't abandon me. Are you Are you talking about um like pro prophecy like I mean prophetic what is it called like you vi visioning things and saying things what is what do they call that prophesying? No, my father didn't abandon abandon me. Um, I'm being I am being technical because that matters. My my mom left my dad. But my father didn't abandon us. Or my father didn't abandon me and my, my mom, no. And my life was very difficult then. Oh, uh, yeah, my life was difficult. Sure. Leonardo, do you think that we can free ourselves from our conditioning? Yes. We can. But I'm not going to come on here and say, hey, I'm going to show you all how to free yourself from your conditioning. I'm going to ask the question. We're all going to look at it together so that you can see it for yourself. Because otherwise I'd be teaching you and I don't want to be a teacher. I understand I missed the target. 
understand. A word of knowledge? Only God can free us. Only God can free us. Hmm. I don't know if I should say something about that now because um, because I feel like I keep saying, I keep sort of like shifting just your comments or, and, and I don't want you to feel that way. But um, the ah, thing is this, God did free us. He right? gave us free will. We were already free but that freedom came with a prison a pri and a prison that that got him god didn't want to touch a, a prison that god didn't want to change unless you wanted it to be changed so but yet you struggled in your childhood yeah tons of people struggle in their childhood like I, I don't know anyone who hasn't struggled in their in their childhood. Now the thing is, the thing is, the thing is this, Pastor, um, that there was, and and Roxana can can attest to this. She sort of know, knows a lot of my 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 history. Um, there were struggles. There were struggles in in my life, my youth. However, I. I uh, I didn't suffer. I always sat and watched everything that took place and found a way of surfing surfing through the through the through the waves of struggle. Right? Now that I think about it, it's not conditioning. One needs to be wary of its conformity. It's nice to have a sense of belonging, community, acceptance, but by whom? By whom? Because when we're talking about conditioning, we're talking about the mind that wants that conformity, that wants, or or we want, we talk about the mind itself that wants that belonging, that community, that acceptance, in order for it to feel that it's worth something. But if you look at at your at the self beat or the part of you that's behind that conditioning beyond behind the mind you already have everything you need you don't need you don't need to be to belong to anything you don't belong to community you don't need to to have acceptance because you have the acceptance of the only one that matters you're in community in communion with the only one that matters you're you have you belong with the only one that matters No, other way around. We got. I. I, I want to talk to you because I, I don't. I don't like reading the text because I. Because we can't write a lot of things here. But come on, man. This computer's not. Not. Uh, cooperating. So we're asking: Can the mind be free from all of its conditioning? Can you look at the events of your life and not label them? Because the pastor is right. If if I would have, if I would have seen my childhood struggles and labeled them, I think that I would be either completely out of my mind now, incredibly depressed or I wouldn't even be sit sitting here talking to you. I wouldn't even be here talking to you because um, I'm pretty sure that I would have fallen for gangs and, and drugs because that's that was the only way to survive in that, in that neighborhood.
Um, let me see. Huh. You know, like, but I I learned at a really young age to just watch, watch what the adults were doing around me, watch what what alcoholics were doing around me, watch what drug addicts were doing around me, watch what watch what uh, gangsters were doing around me, and then seeing the outcome, and knowing, taking the advice of my grandfather, that you learn not just from your own experience, but from the experience of others. And learning from the experience of others, I learned not to touch certain things. I learned that I learned the dangers of alcoholism and I chose not to touch it. I learned the the, the dangers of, of drug addiction and I decided not to touch any of it. I learned the troubles and the dangers of, of jealousy and hatred and resentment and i struggle with 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 resentment a little bit just a tiny little bit because of course when someone does something personal to me of course it's going to hurt me and of course there's something that hold that i hold on to but then i'm quick to let it go because i see the benefit of letting it go because i see the dangers of holding on to it but if i don't know that i am that i'm capable of letting go of something that's burning me then it'll continue to burn me for a really, really long time. And that's that's a sad thing about some people that do not do not see the danger in their behavior. So they continue. And worse, some people think that they are that it's their nature to forever be in this state of, of suffering. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, let's see. Okay. Romans 12, 2. Which version? Does it matter which version I read? Because... I know that the language is different, but I'll read. This is the New International Version, and this is another thing that I that this is what um, what I what I what I'm trying to shine a light to is why do you have so many versions? But that's that's all. So is that a is that a version AMP? Okay, AMP. Okay, you got it. And so my, initially, my question is, why not the new version or the other one that I was going to read? And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively change and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan or purpose for you. Okay, so what's the question? Oh, to answer my question. I want to break this apart if we can. Not in a bad way. I just want to tear it apart because there's a lot of things here that need definition. And I, and I think this part drives people crazy about me. Um, because I don't just accept things at face value and I have questions and I, and I dissect things. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial value of customs. So here we're acknowledging that there's a world and that it has superficial values and customs, superficial meaning on the surface. They're not deep. They're not, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at, the, at my computer camera that are customs and values that are superficial, that are only on the surface. They're not profound. They have no solid ground, right? So we have, so it's saying do not be conformed 
don't fall into a groove. Don't fall into its pattern, right? Into the pattern of this world, right? But be transformed. But be transformed and progressively changed. To be transformed means to be completely something else. To be transformed means to be complete, completely something else, something other, right? And progressively changed as you mature spiritually. So this means that there are people who are spiritually mature and people who are spiritually immature by the renewing of your mind. Now, is this saying that I am to renew my own mind? It says focus on godly values and ethical attitudes. Where am I getting my godly values that I'm that I'm 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 supposed to tell my mind to focus on those values? When would we agree that the mind is limited? Can the mind know eternity? Through the word of God. Okay, so if we're going to if we're going to get if we're gonna go into this, who wrote this? Romans? Who's the author of Romans? Who's the one that wrote the letter to the Romans? I'm not trying to be cynical and I'm not trying to be rebellious, okay? I'm just I'm just asking serious questions here. Focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. Paul. So when you say, yes, through the word of God, this is the word of Paul. Let's go literal first, okay? Literal. These are the words that Paul has written. Right? And I'm supposed to believe that the words that Paul wrote are the words of God. Right? Right? So I'm supposed to focus on godly values and ethical attitudes, but not from God. I'm supposed to focus on these values and these ethical attitudes from what man has written about God. And I'm supposed to trust Paul. And I'm supposed to trust John. And I'm supposed to trust... Um, Luke and Mark and all the others that what they wrote is truth is is a hundred percent from God right so I'm focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes which another man has given me Let's just see the truth of that, okay? I'm not dismissing the Bible. I'm not dismissing anything. I just want to be absolutely clear on what we're actually looking at, 100%. Whether God was working through Paul, I don't know because I, I wasn't there. So I don't know. Is that okay for me to say? I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just going to speak for myself that I don't know. So I'm trusting Paul and I'm trusting the other apostles. Now, I'm supposed to be focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. Now, I'm supposed to take my mind, which I which we agree is full of its of conditioned it's conditioned by the world. So, I'm supposed to take something my mind, which is conditioned by the world, which means that the mind is worldly, worldly, and I'm supposed to use that to focus on something godly and ethical and by and through that focus, I'm supposed to have some sort of renewal and and uh, and prove what is the will of God. That is like saying for me, that is like saying I need to clean my car, so I'm going to take this dirty rag and wipe my car. A, 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 a mind that is corrupted, a mind that is full of 
of garbage from the world can never focus on something divine and pure and see it as as it is it's only going to it's 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 like watching the world through a dirty lens you're not going to see a clean world you're going to say man this world is trashy it's all scratched up and dirty and it's like no it's the lens in which you're using to look at the world that is dirty so how can a dirty lens see a clean world so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. Now, If you are building something and it comes with screws, it comes with screws, would you reach for a hammer? Would you use a hammer? Or would you use a screwdriver? Right? Only, only that which is in tune with perfection can see perfection. If I need a tool that sees what is perfect, is the mind perfect? I'll, I'll read Second Peter uh, one twenty one, but in the in the meantime, answer that: Is the mind perfect? Would you, would you clean something dirty with something dirty? Or would you use something clean to clean something dirty? Only that which is clean can know cleanliness. Two Peter one two one, for no prophecy was ever made by an by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something here that I do realize comes across as harsh, but please know that my my. My spirit is in the right place with this. You brought about this, this phrase to, to Peter. You, you made me read this to prove that nothing in the Bible was ever, was ever made act. Sorry. Is it was ever made by an act of human will, but, but men moved by the Holy spirit spoke from God. That doesn't actually that doesn't actually tell me that it was. Just because it says it doesn't mean it's true. Right? It's like and and please take this lightly, okay? I'm just using this as an example. I'm not saying that the Bible is fantasy. I'm not saying that the Bible is not true. I'm simply saying that I don't know. And I have to take that into consideration, the not knowing part. I can't just accept it fully, fully as it is just because somebody else has said it. I want to explore it. I want to ask the questions. I want to see whether or not it's true. Because if it's not, I'll, I, I don't want any, anything to do with it. I don't want anything to do with it. 
So I'm going to make this comparison, not to make fun of it, not to call, not to diminish the, the sacred words in the, in the Bible, but just to make a point that if I said to you that Harry Potter was a real person and you say, no, he's not, he's a fictional character made up. And I say, no, 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 let's look at the book. See here, it says that Harry Potter did A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And you don't accept it. You're like, what? That's just a book. And I said, no, but the, here, it proves it here. It's here. It says it here in his book. Using the book to prove that the book is real is not enough, I don't think. There are no half measures, either it is true or it is not true, but it, but it, but in this case it can be because I can write, I can, someone can write a biography of my life and there could be things in it that are, that actually happened and things that the person exaggerated or added to it just for the sake of entertainment or because he wanted to, he, maybe the author had some agenda. Maybe what if, you know, we have people who, many people who wrote books and they gathered those books together. How do we know that the books are complete? How do we know that they that it was actually inspired? Or how do we know that some parts were inspired and some parts weren't? I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying it's not true. So let's not let's not go there yet. What I'm saying, all I'm do all I'm doing is is questioning it questioning it because if if tonight and I'll, I'll use pastor as a, as an, my example here if if tonight god father comes to me or jesus comes to me and he says leonardo i have a really important task for you it's very important here I need you to write a new book. I need you to write a book and I want you to write word for word everything that I command you to write. And being the good, obedient son, I write everything word for word without changing a single thing, changing anything. Nothing has changed. And then the next, and then he says, I want you to now. Take this book and I want you to give it to Pastor y Profeta Luis Isiano. I want you to give it to that pastor and tell him that it's my new commandment for what I want in his church. Okay. God instructed me to write these words word for word. And I do it. And I give it to the pastor. The pa God didn't come to the pastor. God came to me. And he entrusted me with that. And then I go and I give it to pastor, Pastor Luis. And Pastor Luis takes the book and he believes it. And he believes it. Okay, let's look at this objection or this rebuttal here. The book has been written from beginning to end. You'll be adding to the story. Are, are we claiming to know that God is done? Even though he said, yes, it is done. But are, are we saying that God, are we saying that God won't do that anymore? Because continuing in my story, because pastor, if I give you a book and you accept it, your faith is in who? Who's Who are you placing your faith in? Who is the pastor placing all of his faith in? So if so, if God actually did that, you you def, you would. 
you would object to it? If God actually did that, So then if God really came to me, really, like he really did, you'd be rejecting his word. You see, I have I have a little bit of trouble with that because a part of me, part of like my athe my old atheist ways come back, come back into play because I used to I used to say this. And except that then I used to say it disrespectfully and now I say it respectfully, but like if God wrote, if God instructed an old Testament and then now we have a new Testament, then didn't God change his mind? There was already a new book. And it was accepted. And now you're asking me to just take your word for it. And I can't do that. God is far too, far too important for me to just accept what somebody else gives me. I have to question it. But if you accept what I wrote, if you take it, your faith is in me, not in God. Your faith, you're putting all your faith in me that I actually wrote word for word what I was instructed to write. And that I didn't change a single thing. Olivia, I'm saying that if God instructed me tonight to write a new book, and he really did this, like for real, like really, really told me, came to me and instructed me to write, despite all the fact, despite the fact that in churches you've been taught that the book is already complete. Because I know, I know for a fact that there were other books that were written that didn't make the final, the final cut. Somebody decided that they weren't worthy, worthy. Somebody had another human being decided that it's, it's a no go. You see? So, so if God instructed me to write something word for word and I presented to you, presented it to you the next day as the, the word of God, and you accepted it as the word of God, who's who do you have faith in? It is, okay, I want you to understand one thing, that every, every book claims that. I mean, there are a lot of things that in the, in the Vedas, the Hindu scriptures, that have historical backups. And there are cities that are very descriptive in, that, in, 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 in their book, in their writings. And their prophecies are also 100%. So they claim that, okay? Yeah, and I I understand that. I I understand that. But to say that it is an eyewitness account and to say that it is the word of God are two different things. They're two different things. It's like it's biography and autobiography are not the same thing. Um, actually, Lord Krishna has risen multiple times. 
I mean, do we know? Do we do we know the stories, or are we just saying, are we just making assertions of 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 other religions that we know nothing about? Do you know the story of Krishna? Do you know the story of of Lord Vishnu? Because Krishna, Lord Krishna is another reincarnation of Vishnu. And he has multiple reincarnations. I think it's dangerous for someone in one group to talk about another group that they themselves have not lived with, experienced, studied with, learned, learned with. And by learning their culture or their ideas or their beliefs, I don't mean with a with a Christian scope, but that you look at it completely, entirely, without rejection, without accepting, just to look at it. How do we really know things like this? How did you come to that? I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm not saying that reincarnation is a thing. I just made a statement, not that I believe it, but I just made a statement because that's what they believe. And their beliefs are just as strong as your beliefs. No, sir. I, I would, I would ask you to just, even if you wanted to just Google things, or if you want, email me, and I'll email you some some things about the uh, in in the Bhagavad Gita. The conversation that Lord Krishna has with with Arjuna is is not that. Have you read it? I would probably think probably not. And I don't mean that disrespectfully disrespectfully. Olivia, sure. You can either message me on Instagram or message me, uh, send me an email. Sure. I think it's dangerous to veer away from God's teaching when you have so many Christians who, who watch your content. Hmm. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to veer away from it. All I'm all I'm doing is I'm pointing, but but you say that Jesus said I am the way, but but so did Krishna. In fact, Krishna, the word Krishna means Christ, 
It means anointed, the anointed one. And Christ also means anointed. And in no way am I saying that Krishna is the way. I'm just, I'm just saying we make claims like Christ is the only one that said it, and it's that's not true. In in writing, at least, I'm not sure if he, I'm not I'm not sure that he's the only one that said it, and I'm not sure that he's not the only one that said it. Because what one apostle wrote about Jesus and what he said, so did another another devotee wrote, write about Lord Krishna. I'm not trying to teach people about Krishna, by the way. I, I, I really don't want to go there. I love what you do because I'm, I'm the same way. I question everything. So whenever I talk about something, I know completely what I'm talking about. Who's I? Who's I? Who's the I that knows? Because if you question everything, but you're you're still sitting on the Christian chair, you're filtering everything that you're questioning through through your Christian. Uh, ideas and your, your Christian beliefs. And I know that some of you say, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. But then are you actually seen? Are you actually seen? Because even my Christian belief, I question. But are you questioning still as a Christian? There's nothing wrong with being, with questioning. There's nothing wrong with questioning. What's wrong, I feel, is our desire to attain something in the belief. To Then, then it becomes a, transac a, tra a transaction, something that I trade off. I don't, okay, I see it in the skeptical chair many times. Can you just, can you just sit? That's it. No skeptical. Oh, no, never mind. This this uh, the conversations. <laughs> it's uh, it's a lot more um, critical, or I don't know what word I should use. If you go to court and are found responsible for a a tort, are you in fact responsible? 
for a tort, like a torta. Hang on, the word tort is new to me. A wrongful act or an infringement of a right. Okay, a wrongful act. Am I, am I responsible for it? No. Question, can you accept truth when you see it? Uh, I have an answer. I have an answer, but I don't know that it's going to satisfy. No, yeah, no offense taken. Um, I know. Um, let's see. You're When you are, I'm going to ask you a question. When you are seeking truth, when you are seeking truth, and then you you arrive to that truth, the arrival of the to the truth, the the, the seeing of the truth, is the end of the seeker. Right, because once you you're, once you're there, you're there. You don't need to. You, the seeker is no more. Right. If there is still someone who accepts, If there is something that accepts, then this is still this can still be the false self that is accepting the truth, the mind that can accept that truth. If there is something there to receive it, then 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 it's not truth. This is this is. Okay, let's let's look at it this way, Pastor. The, sorry, it, it took me a while to download. The the truth is not bound by time, right? You could tell Auntie that I'm 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 okay. I'm I'm good. Thank you. Right, Pastor? The truth is not is beyond time. It's timeless. Right? It's not bound by time. And and the mind is bound by time. The mind goes about reading researching praying meditating practicing it puts effort towards wanting to know the truth so the mind that is in time will read and practice and 
pray and meditate and in some cultures will turn will put its body into a pretzel it will uh, uh starve itself it will uh, uh flog itself it'll um it'll do it'll create all kinds of practices to to attain something that is beyond time Can the truth be reached by this process? Can I read and read and read and read? Can I can I search? Can I sit in a quiet room and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray until until I accept truth? Those practices are called religion. So through religion, can I achieve the truth? Does the Bible say, be religious and know that I am God? Does it say, think and think and think and think and know that I am God? Does it say, pray and know that I am God? Does it say, Accept and know that I am God. So if I cannot, if my mind cannot touch the eternal, if my mind can never touch the infinite, if my mind can never touch the truth, can never see truth because it is limited and the truth is not limited. So the mind being limited by all of its accumulation, all of its thought, all of its research, all of its process, all of its conditioning, if it can never see that which is divine, that which is sacred, then what can? What is it that accepts truth? No, no, no! Don't, don't be so quick to answer with something, something like, mm, forget the word, but like a mechanical, like that's why this, like no, like what is it that sees? What is it that sees the the eternal? What is it that it, that can 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 acknowledge that sees that experiences that lives that merges that is one with the the truth with the eternal. Religion is for the mind. I'm not doubting here, okay? I'm not I'm not trying to throw a wrench in the machine. I'm not saying that Christianity is wrong. I'm not saying that the Bible is wrong. I'm simply questioning it. It doesn't fear question. A big process, a lot to write. Let's see. No process. Don't give me a process. Don't give me, don't answer with a process. Don't answer with a method because all of that is still within the realm of the mind. The mind is the one that wants a method. Show me how. Show me how. And so they give them, yeah, here, meditate like this, and then you'll reach the enlightenment. Show me how. All you need to do is practice the, these poses and yoga and then kundalini this, and then your, your, your chakras will be activated, and then you'll experience the divine. That's a process. That's, those are methods. The mind loves that because it wants something to do. I'm saying what? How, what sees God, what experiences God that does not require the mind to enter into it, that does not require effort, that you can see it in an instant like that, not, not 
not even the putting of the fingers together and the snapping is fast enough that it's done faster than that even with no effort whatsoever on the part of of the mind or the heart the mind is limited the mind cannot see the eternal it only is only limited by the past the mind is the past it only it's only it fills its content with everything from the past, everything that it's learned, everything that it's experienced. And so therefore, when you turn to the mind, it cannot tell you the eternal. It only tells you the past. Like I spoke, like I said earlier, when you go, when I go into the to the to the desert, and I see the the vastness of the universe, and I look up into the night sky, and I could see the the the, the Milky Way, and all the stars, and I see its beauty. In that moment, I cease to exist. The me doesn't exist and therefore I can experience what God has created and I can stand there in its wonder, in all its wonder and its vastness and its beauty and see it because it's a reflection of me. The real me, the, the, I hate that because, oh, because of what New Age has done to it, but it can't even say that without it having someone go, oh, that's New Age. Forget all that. That, that the spirit, me, that I, the spirit, looks up to the sky and I can see myself reflected back to back at me. And in that moment, the mind shuts up completely because it has nothing to say about it. It cannot, it cannot use words to define it. It can't, it can't give it meaning. Only when I step away that I can call it beautiful and, and, oh, it's, I had a spiritual experience and all that, but no, that's just the mind. No, uh, uh, truth sets you free. This include if if it includes the mind, then you're not free. Unless you say, unless you mean that it includes the mind, includes be, being free from the mind, then yes. But if you're saying that it includes the mind in order for you to be free, then no, it's not because the mind cannot act and and reach freedom. Because if it does, it's going to be quiet. It it's going to commit. Suicide. Process means time, right? I'm not talking about time, because God, because God, because God, and time, because God, Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is on the other side of time. I do have children, Blue Magic. I do. Oh, why does it sound new age? I'm, I know that it sounds new age because you've heard it dozens of times and your pastors will tell you that it's new age, it's new age, it's new age. But the way to tell the difference is that I'm not giving you a method. I'm not giving you a process. I'm not giving you something to practice, something to believe. I'm not giving you breath work. I'm not saying if you, if you sit in, a, in this pose and breathe, then you'll get this. I'm not giving you anything. You're not walking away with something other than that. All I'm telling you is I'm telling you the same thing. Surrender to Jesus, love Jesus, obey him. If you love him, you will obey him. And his commandment is to love one another. If you're loving others, then there is no you. And plus, New Age is um, is 
someone who studied it, it, it could, you come to it in two ways you're either a christian and you disagree with some of the things that that Christ, that the christian church teaches you and then you move to say buddhism and you like what they say and what you do is you make a cocktail of both uh philosophies or both religions and well buddhism is not really a religion um, but you take something from the Buddhist or the Hindus, and then you make it into like this thing where it's cool to be Christian and it's cool to be this other thing. And so they call that new age, right? Or they go and they practice yoga and they hear someone say something about tantric yoga or, or that the Kundalini thing. And they, then it's just like the apple. They're, they're shown something and says, hey, man, if you eat from this apple, you could be, you, you could be, you can manifest your reality and all this other stuff. And then they eat from it. And then what they do is they pervert the thing. They pervert the practice. And, and instead of it being a, a Hindu practice or a Buddhist practice, they now say that it, they've extracted that and they made it its own. How can we obey commands without the mind? <laughs> Figure it out. Don't, okay, so first don't reject it. First don't, don't say it's impossible. Look at it. I'm not asking anyone to separate the mind or to do anything with the mind, except look at it. Except look at it, observe it, watch it, see how it tricks you, see how it, see how it can, it, it create, it, see how it causes you to act in ways that go against your spirit. See how you're carried away by it. See how, how it, it has added meaning and defined things to mean things that, that get you into trouble. For example, someone calling you, calling you a name, calling you stupid, and, and then it gets angry because it has an image of itself that it's the smartest person in the world. Someone comes along and calls you stupid and it, and it goes against the image that it's created of itself. So it becomes angry and then it becomes violent. And you watch the process of the mind and you see, and you don't want to change it or affect it or say that I'm violent and I want to be nonviolent. So you're, so through the mind, you make an effort to not be nonviolent. You're still using the mind to, to change something that it, that it is. So instead of putting forth an effort to do something about it, the mere Seeing it, the just the looking at it, the mere observance of it frees you from it. Just looking at what the mind does, you gain insight, which means what? Sight into it. And if and then behind that, there's an intelligence that arises from that from that seeing, and you know not to touch it. This right here, if we use it rightly, it serves us well. If we use it poorly, it can be an enemy for us. Your mind is supposed to obey you. How can you obey a commandment without a mind, without your mind? The mind is a part of free will. God wants us to choose him, to love him, because we want to, not by force. The mind is a test to see what you choose with free-willed mind. See, when you surrender to, to God, you have to surrender the mind too. You can't keep the mind. The mind will make a mess out of everything. And, and then all, all it'll do is it'll keep you, it'll continue sinning because it has its own ambitions. It has its own goals. It has its own comforts. Something should be left in mystery. Trust God with mystery. 
allow Holy Spirit to guide your thinking. Your thinking will change, therefore mindsets will change. I understand the second part of it. The, I don't understand some things should be left to mystery. Our minds can't comprehend all that God is. That's right. It's, it's, but yet it likes to be the one that knows the truth. It likes to be the knower of truth and it can't. It can't be the knower of truth. But there's something that understands God. There's something that sees the truth and doesn't touch it. It doesn't want to organize it. It doesn't want to put it into words. It doesn't want to put it into a process. It doesn't want to put it into a method. It doesn't want to organize it into ideas. It doesn't want to write it in a book. There's not enough books in the world to, there's not enough paper in the world to ever fit the entirety of that, the vastness of that. There's not enough conversations about this trickiness of the mind. We only tell people to be careful not to let demons into our minds, to be careful that our minds are fixed in Christ, but we don't ever talk about how the mind functions, how it works. I'm not against Christianity. I I want to question all of its all of its ideas, all of its assertions and and sift through the truth. Sift the sift the truth. If we're not careful, we won't we won't even bother bringing peace and love and kindness and all that all the things that are that were mentioned in that Romans chapter that the pastor had me read. If I don't fix it in myself, I can't tell others to be loving and kind when I'm being impatient. I want pizza. Give me some pizza. <laughs> So I'd say if, if, if I, I would say that if we are truly concerned about dark forces entering, then we have to, we have to understand how we function. We have to, we have to understand how my mind works so that I know how, how those forces enter and how they trick, not just be afraid of them and say, and pray about it. But to know 100%. Otherwise, fear will drag me away from God's peace and I'll be living in fear, which is a door. We have to ask those questions and not be so quick to answer, but ask the questions. And really just keep asking it and asking it. And every time our mind comes up with an answer, we question that. And when our mind comes up with an answer, we question that. And if our mind comes up with an an the answer, we question that until the mind cannot come up with any more answers. And all that's left is the truth.
when is a door not a door when is a jar <laughs> Erica, yeah okay i'm gonna get off of here because i think erica's done with what she was doing and she wants me to give uh give her a call mind will be custom to info the mind is the mind is only there to gather the information the problem is that it likes to be the knower of that information right but we have things like alzheimer's where the brain forgets certain information and it wants to access that information but it can't access the information because it's not the knower the brain is the, the brain is the store of that of of the of the information and then the mind goes uh have you ever forgotten something the mind is limited it can't it can't store all of it all at once it wants and even still it wants to be the knower of that information i want to be the knower of god i want to be the knower of wisdom I want to be the knower of truth. And so then I, I'm going to go online and I'm going to preach truth to other people when I don't even know it myself. I want to warn people about this other thing that I don't even understand. Simply because it doesn't fit the frame that I've created. That's all. I'm going to head on out here because I, I see that uh, Erika wants to uh, have a conversation or, or talk to me. That's why we should have taken the mind of Christ for it, for it is truth, peace, and leads us in darkness. Right, like it's some, that's something to think about. Can you replace your mind with his mind? So that when you look at something, instead of it being your conditioning, your old self, your old life, interrupting that, that scene, that it is Christ's mind that comes up and tells you and 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 reveals it for what it is true all right everybody well thank you so much for entertaining my silly questions and for uh entertaining my answers and for for your questions as well thank you for for everything um feel free to message me well i'm gonna jump on here from time to time and just have these conversations i think i think they're better here on on youtube than they are on on um on instagram only because the live chat stays so if i ever want to see it again we can i can um i can look at your answers and uh, yes, I will pray for your auntie. If you can all please join join us and pray for Mary Leanne. When you say your prayers tonight, please. Excellent. Thank you all so much for your for your input and for walking walking through this with me. We'll have more conversations like this. And thank you for being keeping it peaceful. I know that I saw a couple of comments that were like getting a little um, a little um, passionate, but I appreciate your respect. And I'm doing my best to respect you all as well and your ideas and your beliefs. Um, so appreciate it. All right. See ya.